Hello, my name is Teresa Schöldele. I'm a speech and language therapist. And today I'm very happy to present to you some of the work that my colleagues and I were fortunate enough to publish in Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. The research of our working group is focused on communication disorders in individuals with neurological conditions. And this particular paper was on dysarthria syndromes in children with cerebral palsy. I present this work also on behalf of Elisabeth Haas and Wolfram Ziegler, and it's been done at the Clinical Neuropsychology Research Group, a working group at the Institute for Phonetics and Speech Processing of the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, Germany. The classification of syndromes is a traditional approach in the description of adult dysarthria. It builds on the seminal work by Frederick Daly and colleagues, and the basic assumption is that dysfunctions of specific brain structures evoke similar motor impairments in both the limbs and the speech apparatus. So for instance, lesions of the cerebellar circuit may result in ataxia in the upper limbs, but also in a specific speech impairment, which would be classified as ataxic dysarthria accordingly. For each dysarthria syndrome, we expect a perceptually distinct pattern of symptoms such as in the case of ataxic dysarthria, voice tremor, fluctuations of pitch and loudness, scanning speech, and so on. When it comes to children, there is an ongoing controversy over whether they have dysarthria syndromes that are comparable to those of adults. Some authors did report symptoms that were specific, for instance, for ataxic dysarthria in children, but other authors failed to find these specific symptoms. So if there should be differences between children and adults regarding the occurrence of dysarthria syndromes, there are at least two different explanations. First, in children with neurological conditions, brain damage affects a structurally and also functionally undifferentiated, but also very plastic brain. So different reorganization processes may be effective in children, leading to a specific manifestation of the speech impairment. In this case, the age of acquisition would be the crucial factor. The second explanation assumes interactions with developmental factors, such as developmental speech characteristics. In previous work, we found a large range of developmental speech features in typically developing children, and these features may also shape the clinical picture of childhood dysarthria. So in this case, developmental age would be responsible for differences to adults. 26 children with cerebral palsy with CP participated in our study. The three motor pattern mechanisms that are typical for CP were all represented. So we had children with spastic, with mixed dyskinetic and also ataxic CP. And please note here um, that this classification is based on the assessment of the limbs only and does not account for speech. There was one comparison group of adults with CP and we had three comparison groups of adults with different etiologies um, who all had dysarthria syndromes that we also expect in CP. So we had a spastic group, a hyperkinetic group, and also a group of adults with ataxic dysarthria. All participants were assessed with a German dysarthria tool, the Bogenhausen dysarthria scales, which has also been adapted for children. We obtained ratings on all relevant dysarthria symptoms, which we entered then into a mixture discriminant analysis. Put simply, we determined the characteristic symptom patterns of the comparison groups and then mapped those onto the groups of adults and children with CP. The first result, and this was crucial for the further procedure, was that 97% of the speakers of the comparison groups were reclassified correctly. So we were able to apply our model onto the groups of children and adults with CP. And these are the results. What is depicted here is the classification probability. That is the probability to be classified with either spastic, hyperkinetic or ataxic dysarthria, both for the children and also the adults with CP. And as you can see here, the classification probability was significantly lower in children than in adults with CP. And this was especially clear in terms of spastic dysarthria. So our first conclusion was that syndromes are less clear-cut in children. 
And since the syndromes were clearly observable in adults with CP who also experienced early brain damage, we assume that this is probably rather due to developmental factors. We also compared the CP types with dysarthria syndromes in the children and we found dissociations in 11 out of the 26 cases. So for instance, we had children with dyskinetic or ataxic CP, um, but with typical patterns of spastic dysarthria. This leads us to conclude that there may be differential influences of motor pattern mechanisms on body versus speech motor functions. And it's very important to note here that this is not specific to children with CP. We also find these sorts of dissociations in adults with CP, but also in adults with other etiologies. Therefore, while developmental age seems to be highly relevant and should be considered in assessment and treatment of childhood dysarthria accordingly, there was only little evidence that the early brain damage, that is the age of acquisition, plays a major role in the manifestation of childhood dysarthria. Thanks very much, first to DMCN, for this opportunity to present our study, and thank you also for your interest in our work.